Our next speaker, uh, John, is here for the first time in Australia. Um, he's come from Boston, where it was, again, about negative 15 degrees Celsius. America's cold right, right now. Um, so the fact that he's here in our 30-something degree weather is very impressive. He's been working as a developer for over two decades. While he started using things like PHP, Perl, and Java, he eventually heard about this thing called Ruby and Rails and tried to find an opportunity to do a little side project to work in it and then realized that his next gig definitely needed to be in Ruby and Rails. Uh, he's been working with it since. Uh, one of his uh, pr things that he's working in at the moment is at Privia Health, which is uh, a company that's focused on trying to make the American healthcare system a bit better, you know, like ours. <laughs> I mean, a bit better is a low bar for the American health system. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they're trying to do some really good things. He's uh, a panellist on the Greater Than Code podcast, uh, and he's also helped organise the Scholarship and Guide program at RubyConf US, which is what we have modelled our own guide program that we've implemented this year at RubyConf. Um, I think that's about all I have to say, so please make John very welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hacking Your Emotional API. Today, I'm going to talk about emotions and the impact that they can have on our lives as developers. My name is John Sowers. As she said, I've been coding for more than 20 years. And in addition to being a founder, CTO, and developer, I spent years helping people as they worked through some of their most intense emotional experiences. And based on what I learned there, I've created a metaphor to describe how emotions work. So I'm going to walk you through that. I'm going to talk about why it's important to use that to understand them. And then I'm going to go into techniques that you can use to level up your skills. But first, I'm going to start with a quote. <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. Um, and I think a lot of us can relate to that. But I do have to ask the question, why? Why do we, so few of us feel like we understand what our emotions are doing? And I think it has a lot to do with how we're raised. At most, we only get half the picture. We get constant feedback as children about what not to do. Don't cry, don't run, don't make a scene, use your inside voice. But what we almost never get are what we should do. Nobody tells us what to do to handle our emotions in appropriate ways or to express our feelings properly. Our parents probably didn't tell us this, mostly because they probably didn't know themselves. And school isn't really any help, because like parents, they will, would punish us for improperly handling our emotions. But they don't really give us any tools to get better at it. So each of us has to figure out how this stuff works by trial and error. And some of us have only limited success. This was me years ago. So I put this talk together because I want to help everyone improve in this area. And this talk is built from my own experiences. It's one way to approach thinking about your emotions, but it's not the only one by far. So if this model doesn't work for you to understand them, there are plenty other out there, and I hope you can find one that does. So let's talk about our emotional API. These are the core endpoints. <laughs> they handle all of our basic emotions, and they're hardwired in. But these endpoints don't get called directly. We have a layer of emotional middleware. <laughs> in it, there are thousands of mappings that translate things that happen to us into that emotional API. And these mappings are created over the course of our lives as things happen to us. And they're different for everyone. The person on this slide is completely different than the person on this slide. And the middleware we're looking at here is actually a simple case. One event triggering one feeling into that. And this can actually be much, much more complicated. Beyond a simple mapping, there can actually be chunks of code, like a controller method, that can send massive traffic into that core API. So let's take an example. We'll pull the pop one off that list there, losing your job. The code for that might look like this. We can see 100 calls to the fear endpoint, 20 calls to the sadness endpoint. This is going to cause a very strong emotional reaction. There's also some bad news. <laughs> any person can call any of these endpoints at any time. But it's actually OK, 
Because by practicing some of the tools that I'm gonna talk about today, you can actually rewrite your middleware. You can refactor methods like this and choose the responses that you send when those API calls come in. And that's basically the metaphor. It's a framework for understanding how and talking about feelings. And what I like about this model is that it breaks down this big blob of ill-defined, messy stuff into smaller concepts that you can talk about a little bit more easily. And I'm going to segue into the next section with another quote. <laughs> so I don't actually enjoy working with emotions, and you probably don't either. And unfortunately, I can't change that. So, to illustrate why it's worth going through the discomfort of doing emotional work, I'm going to talk about some of the surprising and not so surprising effects that emotions can have on the work we do as developers. I'll start with this unpleasant truth. No matter how much you want to, you can't actually avoid your feelings. In studies of people that were trying to suppress an, an emotional response, when we look at their nervous systems, we see them fail. We see the effect of the emotion they're trying to suppress remain or intensify because they're trying not to show that emotion. So emotions are really, really unavoidable. Let's look at how they affect our ability to do our jobs, just sitting down alone in front of an editor. So unprocessed emotions make us feel powerless. Um, and I'm talking about power in the sense of like feeling in control of your life or your career or feeling like you can handle whatever comes at you. You sort of lose that ability. Think about the last time you had a big emotional upheaval, like the losing your job example from before. In that situation, you probably didn't feel powerful. And studies that have looked at the impact of that powerlessness have shown impacts on cognition, specifically in executive function. So executive function is our ability to control our attention, to plan, to organize, remember details, and solve problems. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like what I do all day. <laughs> and so if that's impeded, we lose that ability to focus deeply in our code, to find bugs, and design new complicated systems. These same studies show that there's also an impact on our short-term memory. So how much of that complex system that you're working on can you hold in your head as you're trying to find the source of a problem? We also can't handle stressful situations as well. Now, think about the last production fire you were a part of, or a demo with the executives, or even just crunch time before a release. Do you want the stress of that situation to affect you this much or this much? Conversely, when you have good framework for handling your emotions, you get back that sense of power. And you reverse all the problems I just mentioned. When children were trained in the techniques of emotional hygiene, we saw improvements in their behavior, as you would expect, but they also had improvements in academic achievement. Their grades improved. Similar training in, sh in adults showed those effects, but also impacts on long-term physical health. Think about that a little bit. When your feelings are working well, your body is working well. So whether it's an open source project, a large corporate team, or just a two-person startup, thriving in a diverse community requires us to develop our skills in empathy, communication, and understanding. And being a good developer isn't just about slinging code. We're part of a community, we're all here today and in many ways, the non-coding aspects of developer life are more important than the coding ones, because the code doesn't get very far without all the people. So let's look at how feelings impact you as you're working with others. One interesting thing is that as you do work to understand your own emotional reactions, that understanding automatically translates into understanding other people. Turns out we're all human and we all function in really similar ways. And in his book, Emotional Intelligence, Daniel Goleman talks about the data he's collected showing that emotional intelligence is correlated with career advancement. 
Basically, it means you'll get better jobs and you'll get promoted faster when you have these skills. So as I said, when we regain that sense of power, we're less self-centered and our ability to empathize is enhanced. As Laura was saying yesterday, we rarely intend to cause harm with our words, but it can happen by accident. And having that extra depth of understanding other per people's emotional reactions allows us to pause before we respond and think more deeply about how our words are gonna come across so we don't cause inadvertent harm. And I think this quote from a developer at Valve Games sums things up pretty well. So those are some of the reasons why we want to do this emotional work. So I'm gonna tell you about my emotional toolkit in the hopes that you'll be able to use these tools yourself. And I've broken it down into four levels of difficulty. Level one are new ways to think about your emotions. Level two are techniques that you can use by yourself to start building some fluency. Level three is applying those level two techniques, but with another person. This is often a bit more difficult because it involves being open and vulnerable with somebody else. And level four is the most powerful and the most difficult because it's really scary to be open and honest in a group of people, but it also has the biggest impact. So let's start with level one. Changing the way we think about feelings can have a huge impact. Because we have no formal education in this, we collect a lot of misconceptions. So I'm gonna clear this up and explain how feelings work. The first thing to realize about emotional reactions is that they're not set in stone. They're legacy code that's built up over your lifetime, and it can be refactored. Also, we get to decide where and when we process our feelings. We have this great background job queue available to us that we can use. It lets us find the best time and place to deal with feelings that are happening to us. So if now it doesn't work, we can place that job under the queue and come back to it later. This is, in fact, the system we're taught to use as children when we're told not to show our feelings. We learn how to push things onto that cue. But because we don't get that extra education in how to handle our emotions, we never pop those jobs back off. And so for a lot of us, that cue has been slowly growing for our entire lives. So the techniques in this toolkit will help you start clearing that cue. Now, people often get caught up in what it means about them when they have a feeling, especially if it's a strong one. But having a feeling is just having a feeling. It's like being hungry. It's a, it's a thing that's happening. It doesn't mean anything about you. Feelings are personal, and they can mean a lot to you, but they don't define you in any way. The fact that you're angry right now does not mean that you are an angry person. It doesn't mean that you're a monster or that you can't control yourself. But strong emotions like anger can be scary because it feels like we might lose control. Now notice what I just described there. You're now having a feeling about having a feeling. And this is where some of the complexity and, pro and difficulty arises because it's not even always just two levels. It can go deeper. Now, the feelings that arise in a situation don't always actually make sense from an abstract intellectual perspective. So think about that losing your job example from earlier. You could react to that situation with relief, with anger, with fear, with guilt, or all those things mixed together. And none of those is the right way to do it. It's just what you're feeling. So even if it doesn't make a sense in the situation, you still have to process it. You still have to feel that feeling. Now, I like to think of emotional unprocessed emotions as emotional debt. Just like buggy, hacky, complicated code is technical debt. And just like debt code, emotional debt hangs around and it makes things harder and it interferes with everything you're trying to achieve in the present day. And one last piece. <laughs> Many of us have had the experience of feeling like a feeling is so intense that if we were ever to let it out, we're never gonna stop. 
If I express this anger, I will never stop yelling. If I express this sadness, I will never stop crying. But that's actually not gonna happen. Experts tell us that feelings really only last about 20 minutes. And that matches my experience over and over again. So that's level one. The level two action things are things that you can do on your own. Both to build an understanding of your own emotional reactions and to start having direct experience with some of the concepts I just talked about. So I'll do a quick aside here. I don't know if everyone's heard of rubber duck debugging, but I'll go through it quickly just in case anyone hasn't. So have you ever noticed how sometimes you're just banging your head against a problem and you're just not making any progress? Eventually you get so frustrated that you get up, go talk to a coworker. And as you're explaining the problem to this coworker, suddenly you have a burst of insight, even before they've said anything. And you go back to your desk and you finish the doing the thing. Now, this happens so frequently that a hack has been developed to short circuit that process. If you keep a rubber duck on your desk, could be a cat or a dog too, those work, uh, and you explain the problem to them as if they were one of your coworkers, it's often enough to trigger that same burst of insight. So one of the great ways of being aware of what's going on with your own emotions is actually talking about them, naming them. So here are some tips for talking about feelings. Now, you may have noticed that this is the section for doing things alone. Let me explain. This is where the rubber duck comes in, because that same hack works when talking about your feelings as it does when talking about code. Sometimes just saying the words out loud to nobody is going to give you that same sense of understanding and processing through a feeling. So think of it as a process of verbally exploring a feeling space. Like you may not even know what the right words are for what you're feeling. You just try some out, see what they, how they feel. Eventually, you might hit on exactly the right word. And often, you won't actually know what the feeling is until you find that word. And then it sort of all coalesces and you understand it a bit better. And it can be hard to find the right word for a lot of feelings because we don't have a lot of practice. So don't worry about picking just the right word. Try a lot of words and see which ones stick. This feel wheel can help support, help suggest words that might be appropriate for what you're feeling. It was developed back in the 80s by Dr. Gloria Wilcox. And it's not exhaustive, and you may even disagree with some of the ways that they're organized hierarchically, but it can be a really good breakdown to get you started. And come find me after the talk, I have copies, I'll be happy to give you one. So, talking through a feeling is basically calling your own emotional API over and over again. It's a way to practice having an experience of what a feeling feels like so that you understand it a little bit better. And you get more familiar with how it feels to have that feeling. I suggest doing it on a regular basis, maybe a weekly emotional retrospective, like a sprint retro, where you just look back on the feelings you had during the week. You can do it as simply as just naming them, or you can delve in more and try and look at root causes and similarities and situations. And taking the time to practice on these everyday feelings means that you're much better prepared when the big feels come in. So I'm going to have to skip levels three and four, but I'll just quickly say, working on your own can actually get you pretty far, farther than you probably think. But if you push yourself to work with others, things get way more powerful. And for most of us, the thought of bearing your deepest emotions in a group of people is absolutely terrifying. And until I did it, I was terrified too. But once I went through that process, I really learned what impact it can have. And so I go into a lot of more detail in my, the parts of my talk where I go into those levels. And um, you can see versions of this talk that include those sections on my website, emotionalapi.com. And while, there, while you're there, you can sign up for my mailing list. I've just finished putting together a quick reference that runs down a summary of all the things I've been talking about today, and you'll get a copy of that when you sign up. So that's my toolbox. Every one of these tools is a hack to get you to a single place, feeling a feeling. Not stopping it, not analyzing it, not denying it, not indulging it, just feeling it, because that's all feelings 
ever want. Now, forever, these skills have been called soft skills. And I just really hate that terminology because it's so, so wrong. It takes a lot of time and work to build up skills in this area, far longer than it takes to learn C or Ruby or Docker. And so that's why I'm here speaking, because I'm hoping that this framework will help you get better faster. And as I start wrapping up, let's talk briefly about next steps. You know how you read that blog post about best practices and you think, oh, this is so great. If we just did this, all of our code would be way better. And so you run to your editor and you fire it up and you think, oh, I'm gonna, oh, we have 800 models. There's no way we're gonna make this change in any reasonable time frame. And that's exactly how it's gonna go with emotional work. Don't try and do all the things I'm talking about right off the bat. It would be difficult. So don't try and do everything. Just pick one thing. Just pick one thing that resonates with you that I've talked about here today, and just think about it. Bring it into your everyday thinking as a way of think, changing the way you look at a thing or some action that you're doing to change how you behave. And once you get that integrated in your life, you can see what the impact is. Then watch this talk again, pick up a video, and try the next thing, and then the next thing. And doing this, is how we slowly build up these skills. Now, your relationships all start with you. Using the tools I've talked about, you can decide how you respond to things, to be more present, more authentic, and capable in all of your relationships. Everyone you know is affected by how you are when emotions run strong. And so getting 10% 10, 10 better at this isn't just you getting better. It's every one of your hundreds of relationships getting better. It's thousands of percentage points of improvement in your life. And that's it. Thank you so much for coming here and hearing me talk. The slides are up online. I will also tweet these out a little bit later. Again, you can watch the video at emotionalapi.com and uh, follow me on Twitter. Come up and get a field wheel. I have a whole bunch of them. And here are references if you would like to dig into some of the research behind this.